Can you hear me? I'm, I'm just thinking that I should probably put this down as well. Hello, everyone. Okay, uh, right now we're having Alexander Bokovoy. Bokovoy, okay. Right. <laughs> uh, he will deliver enterprise identity in Chinon. So, here we are. Uh, and please give an applause. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, this is actually interesting. We have two um, enterprise related talks at this Gode, and I think we have none uh, in all like five last years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, I have an idea why this happened, um, mostly because the server side, which I represent here, uh, actually got ready to show something and get integrated. And um, yeah, really, uh, what is kind of enterprise? Yeah, like many uh, free software developers, I'm working from home. How enterprises that could be? Taking up, going shit to shower, then taking your laptop, and going back to bed, uh, that's enterprise at home, right? Well, almost. Uh, in reality, uh, there are many places where you work from office, but that office is not managed by your corporate IT uh, department. So it's not really your corporate environment. You're still outside of it, right? Um, then the company services might simply be spread out in such a way that they are outside of great firewall, they are inside a great firewall, and the, the definition of what is corporate is really becoming blurry for the cloud services and the cloud services become blurry so it doesn't really matter where you are <laughs> either you're inside a firewall or outside a firewall uh, where you on VPN or not and obviously like many other people I have multiple identities I guess <coughs> in our age we, we all have the identity multiple identities disorder uh, by presenting it yeah, uh, ourselves as uh, many, uh, many identities, really. I, even on the free software side, I have to wear multiple hats. So I do multiple projects. I do Samba, I do Free IPA, I do SSSD. Uh, I did this stuff, the Midgard, which is uh, web-based something stuff, 17 years long. Um, and I have certificates that present me legally, like my identity card has S-MIME certificate issued by Finnish government, which is valid, and whether I want it or not, it's on my Finnish ID card, so I can use it to sign emails <coughs> that I send, and they will be accepted actually legally. And if I want to have this working on my laptop, should I consider this enterprise feature or not? <clears throat> and I obviously want to use all this stuff with my home network, with my corporate network, with everything at the same time. So there is no a situation that I have only one identity and that identity local or that identity always remote. So I work on Free IPA. It's the it's an umbrella project that unifies a bunch of other projects like. Tier 3 server, being an LDAP, uh, Kerberos, um, uh, DNS server with some plugins for bind, um, SSSD, which is the client side of the uh, authentication and identity, and, um, and a bunch of other themes actually. Um, the uh, nature of integration and uh, kind of umbrella project is that you have to deal with many sides with really opinionated people everywhere, especially in the security area, uh, like with Mozilla guys on NSS uh, library, you have to deal with a lot of different stuff. Um, and uh, FreeAPA is available for what, seven years, 
um, available in Fedora. We got into Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Through that, we got into CentOS. And last year, we were one week short, uh, short to get uh, into Debian, uh, into actual official release of Debian, because there was a freeze, and we were one, one week late. So it's there in um, seed. People can use it. Uh, hopefully, Canonical will release it in Ubuntu this autumn because they they are interested and spend time actually delivering things into Debian for that. And for many non-contributors, they know Free IPA for last year or so because that's now your you know accounts. And um, you get actual access to the whole UI, right? And uh, it's interesting. Many people probably already saw the UI, so showing the UI is, is not a big deal. Maybe it's it's useful to show, but you already experience it, which is um, a unique situation because even if we have uh, corporate customers that are running this uh, software, uh, we don't hear publicly about that. And many customers are not really willing to disclose how their um, IT infrastructure is built, partially because of the uh, Snowden regulations, partially because of the uh, competitive advantages, who knows. Uh, anyway, uh, what happens is that there's an increasing amount of uh, corporate environments running on almost completely free software uh, at the core of the infrastructure. And as many uh, corporations are going into bring your own device uh, kind of idea on supporting customers, this means that uh, we actually get those customers coming and asking, can you get the client side working as, as well as you get the server side? So, um, a typical workflow for every laptop reboot, which happens sometimes, I actually lost my um, root partition today because of, uh, well, preparation of this demo. Um, there, there was something that wiped half of my Python install um, and some of Pulse Audio library so that GDM could not start, but um, that's the, the life. I, I, as you can see, I got to get the back, but hopefully um, it will, wouldn't prevent me showing some demos. So, typical situation, you have to sign in some local account because in order to authenticate to your corporate part, you have to be on the, on the VPN if you're outside. If you're not on a VPN, you cannot authenticate, so you get chicken and egg problem. Um, you, usually people do this with a local account, log in, then get on VPN, then let's say get Kerberos credentials, establish session, and then use their applications. Um, Microsoft sort of solved this problem in 2009 by introducing so-called direct access system, which um, proxies Kerberos over IPv6 tunnels so that people can always be online. So it's kind of an um, implicit VPN there. And um, it works. It's hard to set up. But it, as it's set up by default, if the uh, admin allows you, uh, people tend to not see it work because it just works. Um, but the problem is that uh, on, on our laptops, we still have to go through these four big steps. And each step is essentially a number of smaller steps that you have to run. If, if you want to deal with, for example, with VPN, then you have to click more steps there, right? So can we do better? Um, how far we are from really two steps? Log in or sign in in your corporate environment and start using your application. Okay, let's try to log in. So first, I will do one thing. I will show you. I hope this is visible, or should I do? Yep. Is this better? 
let me uh, get the screen so that it's yeah. okay. Um, so my time is one hour ahead of, of the local time, so you can see that it's uh, 17:41 right now, and the ticket that I've got there is uh, quarter to five actually. And that was the last time when I locked the screen. So let me lock the screen and log in into the system. You, you should notice that there is a request for the password. So I log in with my password. And if I look at the ticket, that I got, it's actually a ticket just of this minute. So this is the recent ticket. I'm not on VPN now, uh, yet. This is the ticket that I got just now by logging into this machine. The only thing I needed is actually uh, get a VPN, uh, get a Wi-Fi access, or just a network access towards my um, corporate, which is my home infrastructure. Here and let me get to VPN. I haven't entered anything, so my credentials were entered only once, right? Um, this system is a client for Free IPA, for my home install of Free IPA. Well, home means that it's installed somewhere in the data center or somewhere in, I think, Netherlands. Um, the SSSD part on the client handles the uh, logging and obtaining the Kerberos credentials. That would work normally in, in a typical home or corporate environment. If you come there, plug in the cable, it will look up your Kerberos server and talk to it directly. Um, now, in this system, it talks to Kerberos using proxy over a public network. That proxy, of course, is using uh, some certificates to, to wrap the channel. It's HTTPS and so on. The, the proxy is actually run by the OpenConnect uh, VPN server. So it's kind of combines two, two things there. I first obtain a ticket, and then I present this ticket by um, open, client, uh, open Connect client itself presents this ticket when trying to log into the server, and server accepts this ticket because, well, I have configured the server that it accepts it in within, like, I think, like 15 minutes after I logged, uh, after I obtained the ticket, so that I kind of prevent re uh, abuse of this ticket later. So I have 15 minutes to log in onto VPN. And now I, I'm on a VPN, I have established connection, and I used only entered my credentials once when I unlocked my screen. And if I look at the actual credentials cache, I can see that there are there, there is another ticket in that credentials cache. That's the ticket to HTTP service, the, the service that actually corresponds to my VPN gateway. So this is something that does not exist anywhere yet. It's SSSD, Git master, something that will be in Fedora 23. The server side already runs on Fedora 22. You just install free IPA, install open connect server, configure it uh, with a nice article written by Nikos, one of authors of open connect. And and it works. It's it's really like few minutes of work. Follow instructions, and you go get that. Um, but the interesting part here is, I really don't care where I am, whether I'm inside the corporate firewall or I'm outside. I have a ticket, granting ticket, this here BTGT that allows me to obtain certain uh, uh, other tickets to other services, for example, to VPN. Now, um, what I get is 
uh, a key component of it is the Kerberos proxy. So the Kerberos proxy is something that was written, um, I think in 2007 or 2009 by Microsoft. They, they tried to solve this problem. The uh, protocol is called a bit weirdly, like with all Microsoft specs. Uh, it's uh, KKDCP, which is, um, I don't remember what the first K means, the second is key distribution center and then the protocol, of course. Uh, it's transparent now for Kerberos library users. So if your application speaks JSS API or speaks KerB5 directly, uh, the uh, MIT uh, libkerb 5 library started from uh, 1, uh, 113, yes, 113, does, does the job. It can fail, uh, fail over to a next KDC if there are multiple of them. It can mix and match internal and external ones, but you probably don't want to uh, show, uh, to specify both external and internal, if, because if, if you specify it, um, internal one and it's not accessible, then you're actually talking to some other host on the, on the network that might be uh, forging you at some point. Uh, but with the uh, proxy, you have a uh, tight uh, HTTPS connection certificate, authenticated and, and verified, so you pretty, uh, may, may be pretty sure that you get fairly um, fairly good the other side that you can trust. Now, um, this proxy, uh, the server side of the proxy is implemented by FreeIP, uh, by uh, Open Connect server from, I think, March, March of this year. We started talking to <coughs> Open Connect guys uh, in Brno, <coughs> DEFCON, uh, in uh, February, right? February and the prototype was by the end of February and in release in March. That was really fast. So we now have three open source implementations. One, the standalone one, is is the one that uh, used for MIT integration, MIT Kerberos integration, kind of the upstream. The uh, uh, standalone one is something like 300 lines of Python code. Fairly simple, um, easy, maybe not so performant. Uh, the Open Connect version is written in C and performant and recommended for use. Um, yeah, on the client side, SSSD just triggers the use of it based on the kerb5.conf configuration. If you have KDC's uh, address starting from HTTPS, then it switches into this specific mode of uh, proxy to uh, Kerberos. So on the VPN side, as I said, Open Connect has this in Fedora 22. Uh, I think we will have this also in the next uh, Repatriate Price Linux update. Maybe next after next, who knows, depending on how, how good our quality engineers to, to weed out all the bugs there. Um, unfortunately, OpenVPN doesn't support GSS negotiation and the uh, questions are for 10 years appearing on the mailing lists and people uh, respond by denial, uh, saying that it's um, not useful, not usable, something that you should not do. You should use certificates and setting up certificates is known to be uh, a bit problematic for, for many environments. Um, but uh, we are working also with IETF on several drafts to improve the uh, initial uh, negotiation on the Kerberos side so that there's, uh, there's no way to uh, hijack the initial connection, which is currently I think uh, you can organize uh, a brute force attack for five minutes or so, theoretically. Um, but one thing here is that if we want to use VPN authentication based on Kerberos, we probably want to uh, more stronger 
Kerberos authentication by itself. So if I want to use um, that to log in into VPN, then I most likely would like to use a second factor for, for that or use uh, certificates and the actual, uh, actual smart cards for that. Uh, yes, we will be able to do that with the Kerberos that comes out this autumn. Uh, and the interesting part that uh, we worked like maybe four years on that and finally caught up with the uh, upstream Kerberos community and got uh, some parts there. But before that, I will go into the two-factor authentication. So this is, this is the Yubikey, a normal one without uh, a special smart card stuff there. It's just the one that has two slots for um, HOTP, TOTP, uh, one-time passwords that change over time or change by increasing number of attempts, right? So if I go back here and I, I just insert the key here and IPA has a command line interface that allows you to basically deal with the same way as on the web interface. I will come to the inter web interface later, but I don't have any tokens defined right now. Uh, let me add a token. So another reason why I'm going to the uh, command line is because I cannot program USB devices from browser. Um, there's a small command that basically loads on the client side, loads the uh, Python bindings to YubiKey, programs USB device with the key. Key never lets, uh, left your laptop or actually your device. And then sends the information that is needed to uh, calculate on the server side uh, the same codes that the uh, YubiKey generates. So, to create the token for me. Okay, so I have a token. That's a unique ID. That's the description that we will see in the UI for it. And now, if I go and um, look into the uh, two-factor authentication. It's basically the idea that you have a, a pin and something that something that you own, something that you know. There are two different things. Uh, a pin is my Kerberos password, and something that I own is this key, or something I run on my phone as a software token, which um, FreeOTP is one of those that. Uh, Red Hat basically fork it out from Google Authenticator. At some point when Google Authenticator source code was closed because Google decided that there are some user experience workflows that they want to keep closed. And uh, this uh, allows you to combine a password, combine a pin code uh, with the uh, value coming from your token, whether it's hardware token or it's a software token, to authenticate against Kerberos server. We actually had the first you know, full implementation of Kerberos um, two-factor authentication. Um, can we get the uh, mic? Microphone. Yeah. One, while we are waiting for a question, I will go into the uh, web UI. I just want to try and understand the process. Um, it's pretty complex. Yes. So what you did there was you used command line tool from FreeIPA to speak to another software demon or a software program called free OTP, which is free one-time no. password. Uh, you're you're mess, messing two things together. So free OTP is something that you run on your phone right. 
that uh, essentially a software token, a software version of a hardware token. Okay. So These are unrelated. Okay, good. So what you just did then was generated a one-time password from a key that's already on the YubiKey with free yeah. IPA. I programmed YubiKey completely with new uh, key. I haven't used uh, uh, any password from it yet. I just programmed it and told the IPA server that I have this token associated with my user. Here is the token. Here is the description that I, I got there. Right? And it's associated with myself. So if I look at the users, then this token is associated with a single user, which is mine. My understanding is that the YubiKey just holds slots for keys. Yes. So where does the one-time password come from? Generating from the key on the one side, no? Once I insert it into a laptop, this becomes a computer of itself. Pressing on this button causes it to send keys that are numbers as a keyboard. Let's see how this works. I look at the screen. And you can see that because I have token, the password here changes into the first factor. I guess we, we, can, we can call it differently. We, we need to work on uh, a proper naming so that people understand. But the first factor is, is essentially uh, my Kerberos password. Once I enter it, remember the first time when I locked the screen, this was just a password. It asks me for the second factor. The second factor is something that I get from, from this keyboard, right? I enter it, press it, and something was entered there. The enter is not part of, of, the, uh, um, of the key, but you can program that the enter is added as well. But let's say press enter by myself. <coughs> and I logged in to the system. And um, two things happened. <coughs> so the uh, one-time password token was programmed right, to the YubiKey. And it was added to the user, kind of associated with the user on the server side. The SSSD, when it handles login, it notices that the Kerberos starts responding uh, Kerberos server starts responding on a login saying that, hey, you can actually give me additional information. You can give me additional um, factors. And I, I like to take those factors. Ask the user for the factors. And SSSD says over a PAM stack to GDM, ask the user for additional conversation. So that's why we saw factor first factor, the second factor, and then login to the system is verified again through the same public uh, Kerberos proxy over a public network. Um, I get a ticket. The first factor is then provided by SSSD to GDM so that GDM can unlock a key store. <coughs> because if I provide the uh, first factor and the second factor is the same stream. For example, if my password is test one, two, three, four, and then I have six, uh, six numbers coming out of this, I get the random stream that never repeats in future, right? And then my key store will be encrypted with a random password that I will never be able to decrypt. That's why we need to split the uh, uh, entering of factors so that we know that the first factor is something that we can rely on uh, for other users like like the uh, key store. The other use for it is when I'm completely uh, offline, I have no network, then I can log in into machine using the first factor if I'm allowed to. This at least allows me to live in a world where I can use my laptop I cannot access any other services. My Kerberos ticket is fake, that it's always in the past. Actually, it's a Unix time one, so it's 1970 something. 
uh, I cannot use it because it's faked. Uh, but I can log in into the machine and try to use local tools here. So at least some some um, for the user, it's it's a natural experience that you can use it, whether you're online or offline, whether you're in premises or you're outside. <coughs> And yeah, the credentials were entered only once. Whether they were like two different factors, but I entered them this pair only once. Uh, this system actually expands into multiple factors, so you, you don't need to be kind of fix it with as uh, two factors. You might have three, four, and, and, and more. Uh, the interesting part is that if I got this ticket, right? And this ticket is actually having some information that it was authenticated with a stronger, um, stronger factors than just a password, or will have with uh, Kerberos 114 once it released. Then the application can actually use this information and protect itself by saying that, hey, you cannot just obtain a ticket to HTTP service that represents my VPN just out of blue. You have to have a strongly authenticated ticket. Otherwise, you are not allowed to use VPN. <coughs> that sounds kind of normal for the uh, corporate environments, um, but we can extend that for other services. There is no way uh, to, to limit because the authentication indicator that Kerberos will put into the ticket is signed by the uh, um, KDC itself, that it, it did that work, and it's just a stream, or number of streams. So we can say that, hey, uh, a two-factor authentication, pre-authentication mechanism in Kerberos puts information that we are two-factor authenticated using the key with this encryption or signature algorithm. And then we can differentiate by the signature algorithm strength, depending on where we want to log in. So the, the next step to go is to use this information on the client side to derive uh, some access. I will come to that. Um, so what I can do with the ticket is I can authenticate with JSS API against almost anything. Uh, most of the server software like mail servers like IMAP, POP, and other protocols, they do support JSS API uh, authentication. Uh, web services do support. Well, of course, you need to implement your server using that support, but uh, nevertheless, the, the, uh, there is a possibility to do so. Then for most of the uh, social networks, you get uh, some third party uh, verifying and asserting that you're uh, you and providing a token that, that assertion that you can use. In a corporate environment, this assertion is done with the SAML, SAML uh, specification, which is uh, signed XML uh, with signatures and, and, and so on, including <coughs> um, identity information. So not only that a certain, like with OpenID, a certain URL is confirmed that it wants to use another service, but also includes information like a username is this, uh, actual first name, last name of a person is this, it works since that time so that the application can, can rely on that and build up something more interesting. Uh, we have the um, OAuth 2 and OAuth, you, you just get assertion, you don't get this additional identity information. So you can use the uh, ticket for accessing networking file systems like NFS, like uh, SMB, or others that support it. Uh, WebDAV, for example, supports uh, JSS API because it can be stacked with, uh, at least in Apache, you can stack it with uh, model of curve or model of JSS API and get all the, uh, all the data there. Yes, SSH can use, and that's one of the bigger uses for it. And uh, then you can obviously display properties of the ticket like I showed it to you. The time when it was obtained, some flags, what, uh, what is there, 
and obviously you can, you can renew a ticket if your administrator allow it on the, on the KDC side. Um, unfortunately, we cannot authenticate in Epiphone using JSS API. We were able to do that five, six years ago, but since the switch to WebKit, the, the uh, functionality disappeared. So there is a bug that is dragging in Lipso uh, for, yeah, six years. Um, it's a complex issue. It's not, it's not a funny one, but uh, what it needs is uh, someone taking time and implementing the rest of things. You don't need to uh, go deep into uh, Kerberos or JSS API. The actual modules that support different types of authentication, like uh, uh, JSS API is usually used for Kerberos and for uh, NTL and SSP in the uh, Microsoft world. Uh, we do have JS, uh, JSS API modules for Kerberos, that's the normal one. And now we have uh, Intel MSSP implementation as well uh, in Fedora. And um, that one can be used as well. So th there is possibility, there's nothing preventing other than lack of uh, effort uh, to complete this. Um, as, a, as a matter of that, WebKit uh, GTK is unusable for running SAML or two things. Um, where you are not really using directly Kerberos, but as a part of signing into some portal, you provide your ticket uh, to your corporate SAML server, and that gives assertion back to, let's say, Google Apps, uh, that you are who you are. And you cannot set up this uh, in a single sign-on fashion. Of course, you need to enter your password again at, at the portal. <laughs> so obviously we can do better than this. The parts are in place. The Firefox actually shows that it's possible. So one thing I did is when I came here, I did not enter my password because uh, Firefox actually used my uh, Kerberos ticket because it's configured for using that. So if we look. Okay, let me re-authenticate again, and we will see it. I get something strange. I'm using, I'm using something, some session probably that, that wasn't there, okay? If I get again, So I just logged in, logged out and logged in, and now you can see that I got a ticket to that server principle. Uh, doesn't it only work in Firefox if you if you add your domain to in whitelist? Um, yeah. Please repeat the question. Doesn't it only work in Firefox if you add your domain to a hidden whitelist? Yes. Yes, and that's one of the uh, problems that the UX needs to obviously improve. Uh, we, at the point when we can discover uh, what domains are associated with Realm, uh, with Kerberos Realm, uh, we can do better than just changing some settings uh, in about config and void your warranty, right? So I have this setting. Um, so it, it worked with the hardware key. Does it also work with the software keys? Yes, no difference. Oh, okay, cool. Actually, we can create another token using the uh, software, but I don't know how to show the screen here, uh, how to share it with you. So actually, I can just pop <coughs> it. So you can use three OTP for uh, you can use any HD OTP, TOTP compatible application.
the workflow is that it shows you the QR code. And where is my, here's my uh, free OTP application and I can scan the code. And once, once I've scanned, it's the first one here. Well, I have the same with the same name, but let's look. And if I press, there's some code that goes and disappears. By default, I think it's, it's less than 30 seconds. So I can use the same code. It's, it's not a problem. Uh, now, um, let's get back here. So once we got authenticated, we can talk to, uh, we can decide what, what you can do with this authentication, right? I'm logged into the system, but it's not enough. So for, for example, if I need elevates and privileges, then um, I can derive something from this uh, Kerberos ticket. But the Kerberos ticket usually has life of like say, 10 hours or 24 hours and uh, if you want to derive access rights for example becoming root based on, on availability of the ticket then anyone who has access to the same session might actually use it so for uh, for the um, for this thing we moved in Fedora in 90, we moved the uh, uh, credentials cache that Kerberos stores data in from uh, slash TMP, from actual files, we moved to kernel hearing space. So it's only available in this session or a specific application with defining how you do this. Um, and only applications launched under that session can I have access to the uh, to the Kiwi. And if we look at the output of Kiwis, you can see that I actually have ticket cache prefixed with Kiwi, um, which means that it's not in the file system. It's some way in a secure kernel memory that nobody else other than this session can get access to. <coughs> um, so from corporate environment perspective. SSSD includes uh, some rules that allow you to say to which host, uh, to which service on that host, who can have access. For example, you can say that users from VPN group can have access to VPN server. Even if they obtained the ticket, and the ticket was obtained with uh, strong enough authentication, that's not enough to allow them to use VPN. You can really enforce that. Or you can use a pull kit, uh, that decision in a pull kit, forcing only um, members of admins group to always get the uh, root on uh, uh, desktop machines of, of users for, I don't know, support purposes, for example. And we will have time-based rules so that you wouldn't be able to log in if you're logging in out of hours time, for example, or of any location. <coughs> and uh, yeah, the uh, authentication indicators can be used for uh, providing additional information if it's needed because they are in ticket, uh, they are signed by the uh, KDC. You can actually rely on them, that they are not forged by somebody else. And yeah, we can, we can separate, that, that needs additional discussion, how we define what, what, uh, what is the actual string is there, uh, how we define levels and map them and so on, but it seems to be good to rely on some strong uh, authentication and strong encryption for uh, providing this for multiple machines. And when you have one or ten machine, it's, it's not a big deal to configure things. But if you have more, you get uh, into bad situation. So I will try to skip, uh, get better, uh, better, faster, because we are almost, yeah, we are almost done. Um, so 
you can also fetch the identity information from SSSD, which is not only POSIX information. So POSIX information is your UID, GID, uh, host um, shell, and the um, home directory, and, and so on. If you want more, like what certificates associated with this user, what are um, other attributes like contact information, what department this user is in, and so on. You can ask SSSD in fairly recent Fedora and RHEL uh, about this information. So you can configure its uh, DBus based interface. We are now thinking to extend this interface to allow you to essentially authenticate over it or ask authentication related information, not only identity related information, based on the uh, authenticated information in the session. So you don't grant access, but you consult whether you can grant access. Then um, the other part is, which I'm not going to show, uh, is that with FreeIPA42 we actually added support for uh, managing user certificates. So for each user you can issue certificates, multiple of them, and then SSSD can use smart cards to authenticate against these certificates. <coughs> we also have, uh, it's not working for me, but uh, there's a work in progress to fix this, uh, a password world uh, that, that is centralized for each user with uh, a mechanism to access it from different uh, machines on the different public-private pairs that allow you to store your credentials, your additional some data, and um, access it from multiple sources securely. So nobody will be able to access it other than you. It's useful very for environments like OpenStack where you have automated services that need, for example, access uh, Amazon EC2 environment and they need some keys to drive the Amazon API. So you, you don't put those keys in clear, you put them in Vault and allow them using the JSS API authentication against the Vault, retrieve the keys and run information. Everything is not in clear, everything is encrypted under um, current credentials that you have. Uh, but we can extend the same for users because there is no, really no difference between users and uh, others. And um, yeah, we have this support for um, OpenSC and CoolKey devices and also the YubiKey should work, YubiKey Neo, the one that has smart card in it. I didn't try myself because I have PGP key on it already instead of uh, s mine key or any other uh, proper key, uh, X509 key. But uh, there are some details in the blog posts and uh, hopefully in Fedora 23 all this will be easily accessible. So when we talk about visualizing properties, the current environment in online accounts is pretty appalling. You cannot see uh, what the ticket is, how long since it was issued, and, and all this other information. So we would like to extend this and show the ticket validity. Can you forward it for other service? Uh, can you renew it? Uh, authentication indicators to show user that it can use certain services. And uh, if you have some tickets, uh, already in the city, in your credentials cache, you might want to remove them, essentially saying that you're clear cookie-like um, token from, from that one. And yeah, if, if uh, you have uh, KDC that allows you to actually renew the tickets, the uh, uh, normal online accounts could renew. SSSD is able to do that already, um, and it could renew before the, the they are expiring. But if, if the Ticket was updated with the uh, um, second factor. You have to involve the user because you don't have the new change in second factor to, to renew the ticket. <coughs> yes, that's that's just <laughs> what I say. Um, 
and the needed information can be provided by SSSD. So we can look into details and, and work over the work, uh, UX workflows. And obviously the, the browser problem like, like we discussed uh, about config manipulation is uh, something that people don't really like because they don't understand why it's needed, why so many parameters are there. We can do better. So there's a bug against uh, Mozilla on that. And once we fix the JSS API uh, in WebKit, GTK, I would like to have this also in Epiphany and all the services that use uh, embedded browser in GNOME. And the biggest problem is that the JSS API flow by design is synchronous. If it's synchronous, it can lock up the other uh, tabs in browser if they are not done properly. So this needs to be done in a separate process and, and so on. So there's some work uh, going. And the one thing that I left to show is uh, Ypsilon integration. But I don't think I need to show because we use this with GNOME.org uh, GNOME, uh, GNOME infrastructure already. And yeah, the final part is uh, would be good to see uh, web interfaces integrated into, into settings that you can see them as a separate button here that you press. And if you have a ticket, you automatically log in into web UI managing your properties in IPA or your server in, in cockpit. And Detecting the uh, free IP client is easy. Using SSSD is easy. Cockpit uh, detection is easy as well. And that's it. Thank you. Um, I'm here for uh, until uh, Sunday. So feel free to grab me and, and talk and more. And I think tomorrow is another talk in the morning, right? So I guess we will get uh, a pretty unique situation that uh, both big distributions, commercial distributions, work and uh, improving the GNOME enterprise home <laughs> workflows. Thanks. Stop it? You, you, you no, no, I, I didn't. Yeah. yeah.